ticket making in emerging markets because these this market making has been dominated by U.S. Western banks as banks are, uh, uh, you know, um, basically regulated uh, such that they've got to through the Basel uh, uh, three, which I, I understand you've heard about uh, today, uh, and you should probably already know, that's effectively forcing a deleveraging and um, pushing banks to concentrate on home markets. And some people are worried that this means that banks are pulling away from emerging markets, and we've seen a bit of that. But um, why is it that uh, global banks, uh, uh, the dominant global banks, have been Western banks? Is it because we're somehow much more intelligent than other people? Um, maybe we are, but um, I think uh, uh, banking is actually not that difficult and not that complex. Uh, I think the, the reason really is that uh, uh, Western banks got there first and there's a great deal of first mover advantage. And if Western banks are now retreating from emerging markets, all that's going to happen is that emerging market banks are going to take over. And that's exactly what we've seen so far. Uh, from all the top banks being uh, from the developed world, we now have Chinese banks right up the, in the top 10. We've got uh, banks like Banco Itaú being major market makers in emerging markets already come from nowhere. We're going to see much, much more of that. And of course, this also reflects the move in global trade. Uh, just a few years ago, you know, emerging market south-south trade was maybe 10 percent of global trade. It's moving up very rapidly. It's well over 30 percent now. Pretty soon it'll be 50 percent of global trade. And banking activity will follow that naturally. But it'll actually be the case that it may even start to you know, impinge not just across emerging markets, replacing developed world banks. It may actually go into the developed world itself as well. Um, so I think that's one of, the, one, of, one of the points. I think the other big change post-08 that's going to happen to banks, the big consequence of deleveraging, is, of course, disintermediation. And I think you've heard a little bit about that. But, but of course, disintermediation uh, you know, started really with the birth of the Eurobond market in 1963. That, that was disintermediation. Bond markets are the best way to disintermediate. And what you're going to see is an absolutely enormous growth in bond markets in emerging markets, because these are the countries with relatively small uh, capital markets as a percentage of GDP, and that's going to change. But also, they have been very heavily banked. And this is a, a massive policy priority for a lot of central banks to uh, move towards this dis disintermediation. And the banks are not getting in the way of that. They, they're fully aware that this is going to happen. They're just putting up their hand and asking to be part of that process in, in helping build, build bond markets. So I think we're going to see much more disintermediation. And that means many more bonds. You're going to see a, a massive bond market. I mean, the, the, the emerging corporate bond market plus the sovereign market, I mean, you're talking about maybe uh, something like close to $50 trillion, um, you know, in, 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 in as little as five, to five years or so. This could be very, very large. It could be the largest set of asset classes in the world. Coming on to regulatory responses, uh, first of all, in the developed world, um, I think we have to understand what QE is, um, and uh, without giving you a sort of long history lesson about, uh, uh, or reminder about, uh, uh, you know, Keynes and all the rest of it, um, what we had is a massive bank crisis um, in, in uh, the developed world. And when you have a banking crisis, the, the normal, historical normal procedure is to seize the banks, to nationalise banks. For various political reasons and, and, and ideological reasons, that didn't happen. And it was therefore, uh, you know, the, 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 it, this, this job fell on the shoulders of the Fed and other central banks. Um, and this was a most unusual um, and, and, and very difficult task. Um, and I see quantitative easing as a response to that. Um, a banking system is, you know, highly, a bank is a highly leveraged uh, uh, technically insolvent institution, always at the heart of a financial crisis. Um, that's the nature of it. That's why you want to disintermediate them. Um, and what we've had in, in, in the Fed's response from Bernanke, a student of Keynes, a student of the Depression, was an almost desperate attempt to try and stop the de a, a depression to stop a massive reduction uh, in lending due to a, a big increase in, uh, of uncertainty, i.e. not risk, uncertainty, as in when you have no idea what's going to happen next. Um, there's no probability distribution known or even existing. And that's, what, that's Keynes's explanation of the slump, of course. And so QE basically uh, is designed, was designed to recapitalise banks. 
pushing up asset prices, enabling banks to issue paper into that. But the actual um, liquidity, a lot of it went round in a circle. Uh, having pushed up asset prices, went back to the central bank in the, in the case of the Fed in, in terms of excess reserves. So it just literally went round in a circle. None of that money really got into the economy. And there's been a lot of criticism of QE because it hasn't really stimulated the economy. Well, if it wasn't designed to stimulate the economy but avoid a slump, it's been highly successful. And so therefore, tapering or getting rid of this shouldn't have major impact on the economy either, by the way. It would be moderated in line with uh, the ability of the health, of, of the health, if you like, of, of the banks, the ability of them to, to start lending into the economy and not collapse. So if we've had now several years of uh, nursemaiding the banks and they're now stronger, which I think is the case, um, what we're now going to see is tapering. But that's very different from something that's going to really affect um, uh, the US or, or let alone the emerging economies. A lot of the, the whining by uh, starting with uh, Brazil's finance minister, Mantega, and others, um, I feel has just been a, a political excuse mechanism. You know, this is it's a bit like, you know, complaining about the weather in England. You know, um, yes, it's not nice sometimes, rains a lot, but we all have umbrellas. Um, you know, this is a very small problem, really, compared to the problems, say, in Brazil of, 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 of structural reform needed and of complete lack of investment uh, in infrastructure. They need to spend about a trillion dollars in infrastructure in Brazil. Um, and by the way, it's an extraordinarily closed economy. Uh, whatever happens outside the economy is very minor to uh, the internal dynamics. So... A lot of the so-called currency wars, a lot of the so-called fear about QE is, um, you know, really just uh, nonsense and, and hides uh, lack of action uh, by central banks in particular uh, uh, and fiscal authorities on structural reform. Um, and then on top of that, of course, you've got a few unorthodox economies anyway. Uh, both uh, Turkey and Brazil had very unorthodox monetary policy and they got into trouble as a result. Um, and... What we've got, therefore, coming back to the developed world, you've had uh, also, I think, a, a misunderstanding in some parts between tapering and raising interest rates. Um, the US has had asset prices pushed up. Uh, there are bubbles, therefore. We've just heard that the leverage at the corporate level is exactly where it was prior to the 208. That's actually not good news. <laughs> it may argue to the efficiency of, of markets, but it, it means that, that leverage hasn't actually gone down yet. And, of course, historically, that's normally the case. It, 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 you've had a whole process in the States where household debt has gone down, mainly through initially default on mortgage uh, on mortgages, and that's merely increased the debt which has been passed over to banks. So the overall level of debt uh, hasn't gone down. In fact, it's still going up in most developed countries as governments have filled that void uh, with additional, uh, additional spending and additional borrowing. So we have a situation which, you know, is, is very complex. The, the normal response when you've got these sort of levels of debt is not to have fiscal rectitude and pay off, or, or, off all the debt over time. I mean, the UK had uh, about 240% debt to GDP after the Napoleonic Wars. And it took until the end, so that's in the sort of 1820s, it took till the end of the century to get that down to a manageable level. We're talking about decades and decades. Um, that doesn't happen uh, in the 20th century. Countries, certainly rich countries with electorates that will not wear years and years of, of austerity, um, were, you know, have always used two other main methods. Um, the first method was widely used and very successful after the Second World War, which is, which is final financial repression. Uh, and that is the, the, the prime uh, device today for trying to erode the debt. Financial repression is defined as any policy which um, captures domestic savings in order to fund the government and to do so at a lower interest rate than would otherwise be possible. So this takes the form of regulators uh, forcing uh, pension funds, insurance companies in some cases, uh, to invest in so-called safe paper, which is conveniently uh, defined as uh, sovereign government paper of the issuing government. And uh, the result is that that paper is forced to buy that, 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 sorry, those institutions are forced to buy that paper. And the yield on that paper goes down, which is great for the government. They're funding themselves uh, at a very low rate. 
and uh, and able to do so. But the attractiveness of of that for other investors who have the choice uh, is no longer there. And so they exit. And what happens is that the investor base, therefore, becomes more and more homogenous. And that is a risk factor. Uh, That is uh, one of what I call one of my triple cocktail of of risk factors ahead of a a crash. Uh, The other two uh, being a misperception of risk, i.e. calling something risk-free for a start, which is an abuse of language. Um, uh, What what that indicates is that that the risk is not perceived, not that there isn't any. Um, And, of course, leverage. So those are my triple cocktail. But the first one, this first one of, of trying to... Uh, uh, the, the nature of financial oppression is trying to force investors um, into uh, low-yielding paper. This then creates uh, a disincentive, a homogenization uh, of, of the investor base, and that creates systemic risk in itself. And, of course, this is combined with QE in its current uh, incarnation in that the objective of QE is not to taper any time soon, probably. They might do a bit. Um, but what we're talking about tapering is just not increasing it anymore. In, in certainly in, in, in say the UK or, 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 or Europe, where we haven't, we've still got, I think, a long way to go. Um, and the objective really is to have negative real interest rates. That's how you erode the debt. If you have a, diff, a negative real interest rate of three percent, you're basically going to halve the debt in 25 years. That's how you get rid of your your debt burden, not through paying it all off in real terms. The problem with that is that eventually people might uh, work out that, uh, that they're being robbed. But we do know, the good news is, we know from behavioural finance that people don't mind being robbed slowly. So that's OK. Um, that's, of course, why uh, we don't mind buying treasuries, especially if it's other people's money. And um, that, uh, that, however, you know, may not last. And we may find that um, particularly uh, the big institutional investors overseas might take the view that actually they don't want to play this game anymore. In any event, we've got a conflict between savers who are being, you know, I mean, if, the, if pensioners actually wake up to this and start complaining and complain to their legislators, we could again, you know, we, this could be upset. So then you have to go to plan B. Plan B was the uh, way of reducing the debt, which we all know, you know what's coming. It was used very widely in the 70s, and it's called inflation. Um, it's, it's the same principle. You're trying to have a negative real interest rate. But people are now, you know, know what you're up to. Uh, the secret's out. And so you have a, a much more volatile scenario of policy promises being broken, uh, of people getting angry, uh, of, of, of uh, a struggle for uh, you know, wage rises and all the rest of it. And that can be quite disruptive, but normally very effective in, in, if it's managed correctly in eroding the level of debt. Uh, it really can do that much quicker, in fact, than financial repression. So I think those are the main risks facing investors. Um, and I think this is quite deliberate on the part of policymakers. Um, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually calling you here. I'm sitting in the national bank, the central bank in Austria. <laughs> uh, I'm not just in Vienna. I'm actually in the central bank building uh, because I'm at a conference here with central bankers. I spend a lot of time with central bankers all over the world. And uh, I can assure you uh, that I'm not making this up. Um, this is the historical norm, and this is exactly what is happening uh, across the world now. And it's very unfortunate for savers, and let's hope they don't notice and complain, because as taxpayers, we are. Uh, this is probably the optimal course. But as investors who have a choice, we've got to be wise to this. We've got to understand that this macroeconomics really matters, and we've got to re. And we've got to understand better what risk is and what how macroeconomics affects, uh, you know, uh, uh, the investment uh, outlook. Um, what I'm going to say now, sort of moving on to um, uh, uh, the, the emerging markets, uh, what are the regular responses here? Well, um, there is a, 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 a history of, of, of monetary uh, economics, which um, um, is far too long probably to go into now. Um, but the, the, uh, there is a basic problem called the Triffin Dilemma where you have a uh, currency which is both trying to be currency to the world and currency to one country. And effectively, that's what we've got today uh, and what we've had uh, since uh, the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. The dollar um, uh, is is basically managed by the Fed uh, according to the interests of national uh, interests, uh, irrespective of international its international role. And... What the Triffin dilemma says is that if you have um, different economic conditions, say higher growth in the rest of the world, 
Um, if you don't provide liquidity to the rest of the world, then of course you know you get you get a you get depression, you get a recession at least. Um, you need liquidity to match growth, so you have to issue that liquidity. But if you're issuing that liquidity not into the global economy, but actually into the economy of one country with different economics, um, then that liquidity has to get from that one country, the United States, into the world economy, and that how you do that creates imbalances. The most obvious way is through creating lots of debt. Um, and that's really what's happened uh, up to uh, 08. And we still have these big imbalances. And the international system fell apart. This monetary system fell apart in 1971 um, in a very similar way, uh, or in a very similar, fa- to, you know, from a very similar set of conditions to the ones we have now. In other words, a big imbalance has been, been building. We've got very large creditor nations, very big debtor nations. And what I would take away from the history is that it is always the creditor nations that calls, call the shots. So it's not what the US uh, wanted to do in 1971 that, that mattered. Basically, Nixon didn't have a choice. Um, he had to come off gold in 71. He didn't have, you know, it wasn't really. And, and he came off, when he came off, by the way, the dollar was pegged at $35 uh, uh, to the ounce. And uh, by 74, it was 195. You know, uh, other countries devalued as well, of course. But that is a major devaluation. You know, this is a major change in valuation. And what we have to understand about the emerging markets, particularly on the currency side, is that all the potential for for appreciation is there. And um, we've also been experiencing since since, uh, 08 has been um, uh, massive dollar volatility. Because we express currencies in terms of dollar, um, we have a natural sort of psychological propensity to think that the dollar is somehow stable and the, and the currency that it's been measured against is volatile. But believe me, when all the currencies in the world move, developed and developing, move up and down against the dollar with the same pattern, this is probably telling you that it's the dollar that's volatile and not emerging currencies. And that, I, I propose, is exactly what we've been seeing since 08. Um, so we're actually in a world which is probably quite different to the one that, that, that we might uh, believe. And the Triffin Dilemma is, 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 is a major problem. The international monetary system needs uh, reform to better represent uh, the global economy. After the Second World War, when the US was 50% of the global economy, having uh, the dollar as, as the base of global money, um, you know, had its problems, but basically uh, worked. Uh, until 71 at least, and now um, it does not work. And particularly when the growth in the emerging markets is much, much stronger and likely to remain much, much stronger going forward. This problem is only going to build. So a a very urgent matter is international monetary reform. But it's also the case for investors um, that the really big news that's going to affect, you know, big movements in, in asset classes all across the world are going to come from big currency movements and those, in turn, are going to be driven by decisions in emerging market central banks, starting with China, of course, because not because they're the largest, uh, but because all the other emerging markets are watching them. Um, and so we're, we're and I think this has also explains some of the complacency. Um, so we've got uh, what I'm trying to say is that the so-called currency wars are at least as much south south as as north south. Um, if you are um, uh, an emerging market country uh, worried about um, uh, you know your reserve pattern. You may have you know eighty percent of your reserves in dollars, and you're really worried that you're going to lose thirty percent of that. Uh, maybe through currency movement, maybe actually just through a move in the yield curve. Remember that the average year, the average ten year yield of the U.S. Treasury over the last uh, uh, six decades is six percent. If Treasuries move to six percent, that's a third of your, your your portfolio just wiped out. Uh, for for anybody with a reasonable amount of duration, um, so the idea that this is a safe asset class is 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 a humpty dumpty exercise in redefining the meaning of words. Um, the the central banks of the world that hold all these, of course, are peopled managed by people who wouldn't dream of putting their own money in treasuries. Um, so there's an element of double think, and that's dangerous because it can flip, it can just change, and all you need actually is probably a couple of central banks to if you like, mention and, and shout that the emperor has no clothes and you've got a crisis, not for emerging markets, but for the dollar, including for the liquidity of the treasury market. So this is, this is I think, the reality. It's certainly a scenario out there and we all hope it won't happen. 
But what will happen, I think, in my more rosy scenario, is that we will have a managed uh, 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 process of diversification away from the dollar, and you'll see a massive growth in South-South linkages. As I mentioned, you've already got 30% of world trade uh, being South-South. That is, at least that is going to be matched uh, in terms of reserve holdings, and I, I think reserve holdings may go further and faster than that. On top of that, as I've already mentioned, you're going to see a massive growth in these capital markets. Um, and, you know, there are uh, uh, different uh, uh, sectors, different ways to do that. Um, it's very interesting to hear that, uh, you know, talk about uh, infrastructure and things like that. I mean, I think there are absolutely enormous uh, potential investment opportunities in, in, in uh, pre-IPO private debt. Uh, I, I myself, in my retired state at New Sparta, which is basically my private office, I'm, I'm, uh, because my wife didn't marry me for lunch, um, I'm, I find myself in, investing in India and Eastern Europe, um, and all the opportunities are in, are in private, uh, private equity uh, type transactions um, that I find where the most, uh, the most excitement, uh, the most potential is. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, you know, I'm probably keeping you from cocktails. Uh, I could have sort of probably sp- spoken to the same topics for about five times as long, but I, I'm getting, I'm rattling through it quickly. But happy now, happy uh, to answer any questions um, if we've got time for that. And I would just remind you, if if there are questions, can we have a microphone because I really can't hear anybody otherwise. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. I can. Okay, just one second. Does anyone have a question? Uh, hello. Uh, one question. Until now, the quantitative, quantitative easing money has been uh, going into the capital markets, mostly of the developed markets, to some extent also to emerging markets, but mostly to the uh, developed markets. And you are uh, betting on uh, an increase in the capital markets in uh, the emerging uh, world. How do you see that happening based only on local money, growth of middle class savings there, or um, increased confidence of the developed market investors that are reallocating funds there? No, it's it's mostly the former. Uh, In my time investing in emerging markets, it's been very, very clear, the enormous shift already um, towards domestic savers dominating domestic capital markets. Um, this is a wonderful thing. And I think the real divide, certainly in fixed income and in emerging markets now between the, if you like, the frontier and the, and the, and, and the less risky, is between those markets that have um, capital markets dominated by local capital and those which don't. Um, so you can invest in Turkey. And um, because Turkey, 90% of the Turkish debt market is, is dominated by Turkish banks and increasingly pension funds, which is the really huge growth area across emerging markets, barely started. Uh, I mean, you look at China, they're taking 70%, 17% of, of payroll of the entire country, basically. And that's going into the pension funds, which, which is just growing massively. But in, in, say, coming back to Turkey, you know, it means that whatever view an investor in fixed income uh, takes of, of Turkish development, they can express it somewhere in the Turkish debt markets without ever leaving Turkey. And that's because... There are the instruments and the liquidity, but it's also because the, the, the bulk of the investors are in Turkey. So I very much see this, you know, as a reflection. And of course, the macroeconomics tells us this, you know, uh, you've got countries with massive savings rates. Well, that's exactly uh, what it is. I think that the, the, the distortion has been the really anomaly is not that um, there won't be this growth in capital markets driven by domestic capital in these countries where saving rates are very high. But uh, the anomaly has been that this money has been effectively siphoned off uh, channel to the developed world. It's, you know, the developed world has been uh, living off this uh, uh, um, uh, injection of cash uh, from the emerging markets, which is unsustainable. That's my thesis. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, in terms of your uh, two solutions that uh, economies face or uh, regulatory authorities uh, um, have to deal with the uh, problems with too too much debt. Um, one is um, 
what, what you call a repressive uh, repressive lending, I guess it is. F financial repression. Financial repression, and the, and the second yeah. is is uh, what you call inflation. In, is inflation. What about Plan C, which is is to to work at the long end of the 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 yield curve, and the, and the long end of of the debt curve, and 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 where that is is in in our in our pension in our uh, pension and our healthcare liabilities. So if we improve the quality of healthcare. If we uh, improve the quality of health care, what that will do is because our developed economies have higher quality uh, health care systems in, in spite of our, our, our complaints, um, that, is, that is an area for opportunity um, for us to reduce our debt and at the mm -hmm. same time um, develop products and, and, and services which are, are, are uh, things that the developed world really wants. So if we're improving our, uh, our environment and we're improving our healthcare system, um, that is an alternative to fudging the numbers. It, it, it is. Uh, if, you, if you remember, I said if we don't want to grow out of it. So I would put what you've just mentioned is, is basically comes down from a macroeconomic point of view comes down to uh, more growth and more productivity and more exports. Um, and we know that we're trying to do that anyway. Um, so what I'm saying is, if, you, if you're not going to grow your way out of the problem, which includes your solutions, uh, so I'm sort of, everything to do with austerity, productivity increases, structural reform, you know, growth, trying to grow faster, the alternative to that, and that you cannot achieve. What I'm saying is that all those policies put together cannot possibly achieve realistically a reduction of, of the debt in, in something that is uh, going to be politically acceptable. And therefore, history tells us in the 20th century, certainly, that uh, these other two methods are highly likely to be adopted. There is another uh, um, uh, solution, of course, which is default. Uh, but uh, to misquote Clausewitz, uh, rich countries default by other means. Uh, and the other means are financial repression and inflation. And that's because they issue debt in their own currency and can control it. Hello, uh, Jerob. I have a question about the Chinese Huan. Uh, how do you think the liberalization will work uh, in the future and make it exchangeable with the US dollar and into the world market? Well, I think the it's clearly coming. Um, I think it's a myth to think that... Uh, uh, freedom on capital markets is a prior requirement, and history will tell you that, uh, particularly with the, the, the Deutsche Mark, that wasn't the case, but also uh, various times in history in both the US and the UK. Um, and it may happen much quicker than people think. Um, and obviously, once you, once you do that, you're going to see, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 there's a risk. And I think one of the, one of the reasons why the Chinese have been uh, slow to go to full uh, liberalization of the currency um, is um, full convertibility of the currency is because they're concerned about M2. They're concerned about the, the amount of money in the economy. And this has a, the, the history to this, by the way, actually goes back to 08. Because what happened after 08 is uh, you had a, a, a very intelligent and, and rapid. Uh, uh, stimulus uh, response from China, as you're probably aware, big fiscal package spent largely on railways and infrastructure, which are productive assets, of course. Um, but there was also uh, a massive increase in lending. And because this is a, a, a communist country, uh, um, they can do that. Uh, their banks are not like our banks. Um, and they extended credit throughout the system. And the um, this is one of the problems in monetary policy internally that China now faces. It has the problem of uh, of interest rates and normal uh, monetary uh, uh, um, uh, management of the economy being difficult because there is uh, from that from that period we had a lot of companies basically borrow what was effectively very very cheap money but not actually invest it just hoard it. So now if you try to uh, 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 reduce the stimulus, it doesn't make any difference to investment. And therefore, um, if you like, monetary policy has lost its edge in controlling uh, the, 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 the economy because, because there's so much money sort of stored at the company level, um, that liquidity can, can then be used to, um, uh, to, to do the investments. And so the government can't really control the investment cycle. So on one hand, uh, it's because of that and that's it been eroded, and that was you know some years ago. But that's still the legacy, and it's it's that quantity of money uh, 
uh, lying in bank accounts, um, which has, I think, delayed the, the convertibility of the currency because the Chinese authorities are worried that if they open up too early, all that money will go abroad and actually uh, reduce uh, in the short term uh, the, the exchange rate. The longer term policy is clearly for an appreciation of the exchange rate. And the, uh, if you analyze the data, it looks like they're just aiming at 5% a year. Obviously, the last uh, week or so, we saw some weakness. Uh, and that's largely to do with um, uh, short term dynamics in terms of demand for Remimbi. They like to counter what's going on in, in, in private markets and official markets. But it's also just uh, uh, showing traders that this is a two way a two-way street. They want to remain slightly unpredictable in, in, in their reaction function. So I think um, uh, you know, there will be uh, uh, an, interna- an interna- internationalization of the currency. It will become fully convertible really quite soon. Uh, obviously, the developments with uh, renminbi bonds in, in Singapore and Hong Kong and now London uh, is a move towards that, as are the massive increase in swap lines, uh, particularly uh, in, in ASEAN countries. Um, this is all moving towards uh, a greater internationalization. And China is also, of course, at the forefront of pushing for a multi-currency reserve system and wants the renminbi to be part of the new uh, set of reserve currencies. So um, they see that, you know, this is a, a very, uh, you know, it's a strong objective for them. But I think in the short term, we'll remain with the existing policy of really, despite all the noise, appreciating at about 5% a year. And I think that's, that's, the, you know, that's the, uh, the trajectory at the minute. But they, re- they remain also, very importantly, they are trading treasuries. So we have an, a global environment where when Western investors get concerned about risk for whatever reason, they tend to bring money back to the Western economies and sell them in emerging markets. And obviously, that pushes uh, 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 yields down on treasuries. The Chinese then sell into that, and then they buy them back later. So they're actually making uh, a trade. They're actually uh, arbitraging uh, the risk perception volatility of Western investors. And they're making a turn on that. But in, in the process, they're, of course, reducing that volatility. So that's helpful. But they've, they've got that, that dynamic going on, which also affects their, their exchange rate management. All right. I think that's it uh, in terms of questions from our side. So uh, on behalf of us all, thank you very much for your contribution. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Nice to know the technology works. And that brings us also to the end of our seminar. Uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank everybody here for uh, attending. I hope you've been able to take away something uh, from this conference, which is useful. I think it shows that uh, the deleveraged uh, banking uh, sector has...